Hey drone technology fans, Bill here. FAA UAS Symposium. I'll have the top three takeaways coming right up. Hey Drone Technology fans, Bill here. The FAA recently held a UAS Symposium March 6th to Mar March 8th over in Baltimore, Maryland. What I'm going to go over uh, briefly are some, a couple of stats from that. The top three takeaways. First of all, we'll go over the stats and I'll put the slide up on the screen here. The two stats that I think were very noteworthy here. The first one, over 75,000 FAA certified remote pilots and 1 million registered UAS drones, according to FAA News. Uh, that's an incredible number. The other stat that I'd like to go over here, and the slide's up on the screen, we have more than 10 times the number of drones registered than manned aircraft. Uh, that, again, that's another incredible statistic. Let's go on to what I consider are the three highlights from the um, UAS Symposium that would, was just held over in, Bar in Maryland. Um, the first one, I'm gonna be putting the slide up on the screen. It's low altitude authorization and notification capability, otherwise known as LAANC. I'm gonna read you uh, the slide here and we'll talk about it. LAANC is launching April 30th. FAA's Dan Elwell announced today at the UAS 2018 symposium that the FAA is testing an automated system that will provide near real-time processing of airspace authorization requests for drone operations. This is huge. Um, this will eliminate basically the need, once it gets fully integrated and fully uh, in place, it will eliminate the need to apply for waivers to be able, uh, for example, if you're within five miles of an airport to be able to get a waiver to fly within that airport. This will basically eliminate the need for that to be able to apply manually for that waiver it will be it will be an automated system which which is fantastic and i think that will definitely make things go very much smoother than they are and a lot of times these waivers are needed probably you know on a moment's notice or within a day or two and the way the old system worked that would not have worked here the second point that i'm going to put up here is bvlos and I'll, uh, slides up on the screen and you're, first of all, you're going to ask me, what's BVLOS, Bill? It's beyond visual line of sight. Now, basically, um, we all know as part 107 pilots that one of the rules is you're not allowed to fly beyond your visual line of sight. And that can be very limiting in a lot of circumstances. If you're a hobbyist, this is something that you're going to have to live with for a while. But if you're flying commercially, they're looking at a waiver process for that. And I'm going to put the screen that, that you have up here, I'm going to go through this here, and we'll go over all these points. Um, a BVLOS waiver application must include a safety case that mitigates risks of proposed operation to acceptable level, method for remote pilot in charge to ensure separation from other aircraft, method for remote pilot in charge to know location, altitude, orientation, and direction of SUAS, method for avoiding flying over people, method for determining operating limits of command and control links, i.e. how well pilot in charge knows if GPS is available, what if GPS fails, training program and qualifications for flight personnel, and description of performance-based requirements that the SUAS used um, under the waiver will conform to. And I'll put the second slide up on the board. These are a couple of quotes here. First is from Merkel from the FAA. The aircraft that do not operate beyond visual line of sight largely operate on pre-planned flights. But what happens if something goes wrong? Air traffic controllers rely on predictability. And the other quote here is from AUVSI headquarters. A main point of topic at the, S, uh, at the UAS 2018 lunch panel has been BVLOS. The consensus is, is, consensus is operating depends on airspace usage and quantifying com confidence levels, FAA news. Um, one of the other things that I'd like to add um, on this, and I recently did a video on OcuSync for um, DJI, and that is an incredible technology that basically has allowed, um, for instance, for me with my Mavic Pro, um, you know, I've had absolutely no problems maintaining that um, first-person point of view, which 
is very critical in being able to get some, be, being able to have a uh, BVLOS type of system. So, and again, remember, keep this in mind, this is for commercial applications right now. This is not for, oh, I wanna be able to fly out to this island type of thing. This is for, oh, I'm gonna fly over a golf course and it's within two miles from an airport. You know, I need to do some ins line inspections on these towers here that are near an airport and so forth. Or I need to, you know, this tower, you know, is, is higher than 400 feet and you know we need to do some inspections of this tower it's for these kind it's for these kinds of things th things that would be beyond your visual line of sight those are some examples um, the last thing i want to go over is remote id now i'm going to put the slide up on here um, the director of the acting director elwell quoted we're committed to moving very quickly to establish remote id requirements and i'm going to read you a couple of other quotes um, from angela stubblefield she said, it is incredibly critical. It gives us basic information about the aircraft and most importantly, what the intent is. She also stated, from a security perspective, when we have concerns about a manned aircraft, we can identify it with a tail number. If an aircraft is unidentified and flying through certain airspace, we need to be able to identify who is operating the drone. Um, you know, I think this is pretty much a, a cut and dry type of thing here. And, uh, you know, they're working and they're hashing this out and I'm not going to go into a lengthy discussion regarding this, but you're, we're gonna, it's, it's going to happen. There's going to have to have some type of remote identification of your drone because you're up in the airspace. Um, if you're a, a Cessna 172, for example, or a Boeing 737, or if you're a Phantom 4 Pro, you're sharing airspace. And all of those need the 737 and the Cessna are identified, your Phantom 4 Pro needs to be identified as well too. So that's something that's going to be coming. So don't, you know, this is, you know, don't, don't be shocked and don't be alarmed about this. I'm going to be providing a link to the FAA uh, as far as, you know, as far as the symposium was concerned. Takeaways that I got, one of the overall takeaways from all of this is, um, if you know anything about general aviation around the world, the FAA um, maintains a very tight ship, and that's one thing that I have to say about flying in the United States versus flying around the world. We have the safest air system in the world, and that's because the FAA puts safety as a top priority. And again here, with integrating drones into all of this, you know, basically these top three takeaways and these highlights here are basically regarding safety, and it's regarding safety for all of us for you as a SUAS remote pilot in charge, or for the pilot of a, uh, of a, of a private aircraft or a commercial airliner. You know, we all wanna be able to um, be able to fly safely. And in order to do this, is we're gonna to have to work on this, on, on integration here. And I think that's a key. If you like the content from today's video, please make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and tell others about our channel. Also be sure to check out my Facebook page where I do post daily updates regarding the drone industry and anything DJI related. Also, be sure to check out my blog, where all of my videos get posted out there, and thereby in turn notify all my social media accounts as well that there's a new video out there. Thanks so much for watching, and happy flying!